Continuing in our series today, we're going to look at someone in the, with the name of Lydia. Do any of you have a friend named Lydia? Any of you have a friend named one person? Okay, two people, three people, four people. Okay, five people, six people. Oh my goodness, it's like popcorn. We're going to look at Lydia's story today, and we find that in Acts chapter 16. But before we get to Lydia... We're going to pick right up where we left off last time. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 6, says this, and they. So we got to answer who's they. Who is they? Not Paul and Barnabas. You you got half the equation right. Paul and who? Because remember, they split up. Paul and Silas, right? Because that's what we talked about last week. It was Paul and Barnabas, the dynamic duo, and now they've what? They've split because they didn't want to take who? Do you remember? John Mark. And Paul's like, I'm not taking that fool. And Barnabas is like, yes, you are. And he's like, no, I'm not. And they big split up. And they split and they head different directions. So they is Paul and Silas. They passed through the, okay, someone say that for me. Phrygian and Galatian region, having been for, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So, okay, hold on. They're going out on missions, and it says that they're forbidden. I mean, this is what they were sent to do, to speak the gospel, and it says they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit. Whoa, okay, hold on, breaks. Let's look at that for a second, okay? And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So they're, they're being sent on mission And the Holy Spirit's like, whoa, hold on, bro, which is kind of weird, right? So we're going to see what happens here. Verse 8, in passing by Mesa, they came to Troas. So they're traveling, and the Spirit is is not allowing them to preach. He's, He's not allowing them to get traction like they had before. So there's something wrong. Let's see, verse 9. God was soon doing something different. Verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So they're on this mission trip. They had these plans to go into these places. And the Holy Spirit's like, No, you're going to go where? You're going to go to Macedonia. And so it says that they go. Now, one of the points that I want to just draw out really quick here, and we're going to kind of take this by chunks, is that a lot of times we have plans, right? We have plans, but God has what? Other plans. Sometimes our plans do not line up with God's plans. They may be good plans. Like, it was a good thing to go and spread the gospel to these places, to the Galatian region. We know that the gospel eventually goes there because we have the book of Galatians. These were good things. The Holy Spirit's like, no, not yet. Here's where I want you to go. Paul and Silas are trying to go to Asia. They're trying whatever they can to go to Asia. And God says, no, he begins to put roadblocks in their place. Look at that verse there. It says, and the spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Honestly, as, as we minister here at Ecclesia, we've had some of these moments. We've had plans, and we, we've kind of learned this lesson. We've said from the very beginning that Ecclesia was going to be a place of experimentation, trial, error, learn things. We've started some ministries that were great, and God just wasn't in them. Here he was for a while, and then he said, okay, we're done. These are those things that you begin to do, and maybe they were good things, like the things we've tried have all been Good things, but maybe God wasn't necessarily in them. And he puts up a roadblock and he says, well, I'm not going to send anyone there. Or you're going to run out of people for that. Or you're going to run out of resources for that or whatever. A lot of times God gets our attention and says, no, that's not what I want for you to do. Now, this was obvious for Paul and Silas. We have the text here that says that two times the Holy Spirit, you know, did not allow them to preach the gospel in this region. So God was doing something specific here. You all know the phrase, when God closes a door, what? Another? That's not always true. 
We think that that's true. Like a lot of times God does do that. A lot of times God will close one door and then what? Open another for you. You're like, oh yeah, that's awesome. A lot of times God just closes the door and says, it's closed, sorry. Like, you know, what a, it's kind of weird. We, can, we don't control God. We are there to listen to him. And these guys are absolutely listening to him. This was obvious for Paul and Silas, but sometimes it's not, necessarily obviously it's not necessarily obvious to us so God answered their prayer though he did close a few doors but he answers a prayer by giving them a vision look at that verse 9 what does it say it says a vision appeared to Paul in the night and a man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him saying come over to Macedonia and help us God was clearly speaking here he was clearly closing a few doors where they were trying to work and saying, no, come over to this door. Come, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm working. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes God blinds you on a desert road like he did Paul, right? And he totally blows your life apart. You have these plans and God says, no, I got other plans for you. Sometimes he does crazy things like that. Other times he whispers to you in the silence of a moment. He speaks to us all different ways it's up to him to speak and it's up to us to listen so how do we know when God is speaking to us how do we know like this, this is a this is a pivotal thing for a Christian if God is speaking to us how do we know that he's speaking is he if you have any of you ever heard the audible voice of God hey Jake stop doing that or start doing that or you know what I'm like a lot of us have never heard God's audible voice some of you have that's cool some of you've been blinded on a desert road some of you have been saved healed all these different things and had life change others of you have just listened to God if you've read this book if you has any of you ever gone through experiencing God before this is a great book and Henry Blackaby I, this is kind of cool I did some research we worked through if you were a part of Oasis when I was there last five years ago like to this weekend we were working through this series and in this book, in this book, he talks about how you can hear from God. How do you listen to God? And it's reality number four. Okay, there's seven realities. And this reality here, reality number four, says this. It's up on the screen. It says, God speaks. You're supposed to memorize these, so I'm trying to do this from memory. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, the church, circumstances, and prayer to reveal himself his purposes, and his ways. How close was I? Nailed it? Out of order. Okay, but I, I want the concept. The concept here is, okay, the concept here, I'm going to read it, that God speaks. If we're going to listen to God, if we're going to hear him speak, here's how he speaks, according to Blackaby. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church. And what does he speak to us about? To reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. So if we're going to listen to God, we need to be listening in those four areas, okay? So he's going to speak to you through his word. If you're asking God for direction, go to the word. He's going to speak to you through his word. He's going to speak to you through prayer. He's going to speak to you through circumstances like he did Paul and Silas saying, no, you're not going there. You're going this way. He's going to speak to you through the church, meaning your brothers and sisters, your accountability partners, those people that are around you that can help you discern what God is speaking to you about. Now, I will tell you this. I mentioned this before service. Your church council is praying and fasting, asking God for direction in a few areas. We have some serious decisions to make as a church, some things that I feel like we, just, we need to make some changes here to better impact the area, to better use our resources, things like that. And so your church council is praying and fasting and asking God speak to us in this manner. And so I want you to pray that God would speak to your council, okay? That God would speak to us as a church council and use the word like he is today. Use the circumstances. Use the prayer time. Use the council to come to a wise, godly decision for us. This is how we know that God speaks to us through these ways. And look what happens in verse 10. When they hear God speak, what do they do? Immediately. They immediately obey 
what God was telling them to do. When, we had, when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. These are just like the shepherds. Remember the Christmas story? The angel reveals himself to the shepherds, and he's like, listen, little, the Messiah's been born over there. Go check him out. And what do they do? They're like, we're gone. They go and check out the baby Jesus immediately. When you hear God speak, when he's talking to you, when he's revealing himself, his purposes, and his ways to you, it is our responsibility to obey and to obey quickly. Not wait two years, three years, four years to finally do what he's calling you to do. Just like Paul and Silas, we're going to find out Luke is here also, we're to obey like they did immediately. Now I wonder, I wonder how many of you would say that you've not heard God speak. That you've prayed to him time and time again about something and you're not hearing him speak. Have any of you ever had a friend, and I want to ask you this, and, and maybe it's true, that asks, asks, that asks your advice all the time, and you give them your advice, and they never take it? Do any of you have those friends that are always asking for advice, and you say, listen, I think you ought to do that, and they do what? The complete opposite? Eventually, how do you, how do you feel about them? Eventually, you just don't even answer them anymore, right? You just say, you're not going to do what I say anyway, so why would I say anything? I wonder if those of us that have stopped hearing from God, it's him just saying, why would I answer? You're not going to do what I say anyway. I wonder if our lack of hearing from God is really a disobedience issue. That he does and has spoken to us about what we're supposed to do, and our constant disobedience is just him saying, I, I would answer you, but I know you're not going to do it anyway. I begin wondering and thinking about that this week in my own life. If I'm not hearing from God, am I just being disobedient? Am I not doing what he's calling me to do? I think that's a, it's a thing that we need to really figure out for ourselves and for a congregation. Let's continue in the text up to verse 11, chapter 16, verse 11. It says this, it says, And so putting out to sea from Troas, so remember, they, they're trying to visit this whole area, all of Asia here, and they couldn't. Paul sees a vision. This man saying, come and help us in Macedonia. And so they say, okay. So they're in Troas and they take off. So putting out from sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace and on the day following to Neapolis and there to Philippi. How many of you know that place? You've heard of that place, Philippi. How many of you have heard the book of Philippians? That's where we're going. That's where Paul's going here. To Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. And we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside, and there we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So you see that the text kind of takes a turn. They had been trying to minister, trying to preach the gospel, and God's like, no, no, no. I want you to go to Macedonia. You're in the wrong area, doing the right thing in the wrong area. You've got the right concept, wrong place, is what he's saying to them. You're doing it good. This is, this is all good. Just move your focus over here. You're going to cross this little body of water. Okay, get on a boat. I'm going to take you over to Philippi. Now, let me show you a map here. This was Paul's second missionary journey. So, remember, he starts in Antioch. Then it says that he goes into Derby and Lystra. This is where they split up, right? They split up. And then it says here, this is, he's in this area, and he's trying to visit all of this area here. But what? The Holy Spirit's like, no. I've got bigger plans for you. I've got different plans for you. And it says that they go down to Troas. So presumably he's up here in this area. They go down to Troas. And then it says they sailed to Samothrace, which is right here on this island, the Neapolis. And then they settle for a while in Philippi. Yes, this is the letter, the Philippians letter that Paul writes. Many of you have your favorite verse is Philippians 4.13, right? Which says what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We're going to look at that in a, in a few weeks. Uh, so he's here at this point. Okay? This is where they're at. This is their second journey. They've gone from here all the way over. Didn't get any traction here because God was preventing them. And they says, come on over, the Aegean Sea, to Europe. So the gospel hits Europe here. Check this out. Let's continue. We're, I think I've got another... 
Oh, yeah, so I don't. I thought I had another map, but I don't. So Philippians, they're in Philippi. What I would like to do, and I talked to George and Charles about this a few weeks ago, what I would like to do as, as, we, as we finish up chapter 16, because 16 is all about what happens at Philippi, I've decided that I want to spend the next, I don't know how many weeks it's going to take us, but since Paul is in Philippi now, let's take a break from this messenger series and work through the book of Philippians. Let's see what he writes to the book, uh, to the people at Philippi. He's right here. We're going to see him plant a church. He starts a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, socioeconomically diverse church like our church. He starts when they're in Philippi. And so I said, this is a great break for us to take. And what we'll do as soon as this chapter is over is we'll look at the book of Philippians. We'll look at what he wrote. Now, he wrote this letter years later. But I think this is a good stop for us. And so I started looking at um, series logos, and I saw that one. I thought that was cool, so you're going to have to vote. I don't know. Here, check this one out. This is kind of cool, too. I just Googled Philippian sermon series. I like that one. It's kind of cool. Uh, I like, of course, water because I'm a fisherman, so anytime I see water, it's kind of cool. Uh, no matter what, a study through Philippians. Uh, that one, the, the Philippians is about joy. Okay, so I saw that one. I liked that one. I like that one. It says, Joy, Jesus, Others, and You, a study through Philippians. Um, and then if you were at Oasis five years ago, that we, we worked through Philippians then for a little bit. We, we did it way faster than we will do it here. Uh, we just kind of s- bounced around a little bit. Um, but my prayer, my prayer has been that God would show us where we're supposed to go next. And so this is what I'd like to do, is for us to work through the book of Philippians and probably start like June 3rd or so. Um, And so I'm excited for that because Philippians is a great book. How many of you have read the book of Philippians? It's like three pages, okay? Read it. Seriously, it's like three pages. Just read it quickly. Like, get it, like, get one in you. You know what I mean? Like, get a read through. And then you're like, oh, man, that's cool. And then read it again. And, like, this will be a really cool thing for us to work on. So what happens? It says that they sail all over and they finally land in Philippi and they go down to the river to meet these women. Look what it says there in verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. So there was obviously no synagogue in this place because there was on the Sabbath, if there was a synagogue, they would have been in the synagogue because that was Paul's MO. That was his uh, that was the way that he did things. He would go to the synagogue, he would start preaching there, and then they'd kick him out and want to kill him, and then he would go somewhere else, right? There was no synagogue there. Because it says that they went to the place of prayer. We saw this several times already, that he would go outside the city gate. Here it says that he goes to a river where there were people praying. And he engages these women. And there's obviously just a few women Probably less pushback than those other places with all the Jews who were coming after him for not circumcising these people and all this crazy stuff, right? So maybe a little less pushback, we're not sure. And then he encounters Lydia, verse 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. So so Luke here is describing her. Lydia, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. I have a map here. Um, This is like literally right out of the back of my Bible. So it's hard to see. Okay, Uh, it's right here. Journeys, missionary journeys. You see, where was she from? Does anyone, can you remember where it said she was from? Thyatira. Here's Thyatira right here, okay? Which is very close to Ephesus and Philadelphia and all these places. Let me show you the next, let me show you on the map that you've seen. Thyatira is about right here. This is right where Paul was trying to preach the gospel, right? This is right where Paul was trying to take the gospel, and the Holy Spirit was preventing him from doing it. It's almost as if God's like, nah, bro, 
Lydia ain't home. She's over in Philippi, right? She ain't in Thyatira. She's in Philippi. You need to go see Lydia over in, in Philippi because that's where this woman is at. She's not home right now. You need to go find her over here. And so this is Thyatira. It should ring a bell to some of you. We'll talk about that in a second. But she's here now, far away, some other nation, some other long, far off place. Does Thyatira sound familiar to any of you? So this is, have you heard of the seven churches of Revelation? So Revelation 2, at the, at the beginning of Revelation, there are these seven churches that uh, have a letter written to them about what they're doing good and what they're doing bad and things. And this is one of the churches in the seven churches. Thy, Revelation 2.18, it says, And to the church, and to the angel of the church, in Thyatira, right. So this is one of the seven churches. So obviously the gospel gets to Thyatira. Now you've got to wonder, this, is, this was Paul's desire was to take the gospel there, but he didn't in that first part, right? He was sent to Philippi. So then you begin asking, well, how did the gospel get to Thyatira? doesn't say that Paul went there. We know that he was in Ephesus, which is right next to it. He was in this whole region right here, so maybe he went. Or maybe Lydia took the gospel back home. We don't know for sure. But it is interesting. God has a plan for us, and we have our own plans. And he says, no, you are going to change that up a little bit. I've got something more important going on over here. It's going to be different. I've got something for you over here. Let's look at Lydia for a second. Uh, these judges Google Lydia. Obviously, there's no picture of Lydia, okay? Um, but I just wanted you to see something while I talk about her. As we look at the text, we see that she was probably well off. Lydia was probably pretty rich, like a rich woman. Two homes, okay? Home in Thyatira, home in Philippi. How many of you have two homes in different nations, different countries? And I'm not talking San Luis, Mexico, right? Like two, like this is, yeah, this is like, Someone's probably well off. She's, she's most likely rich. Big enough for her to have a house that holds her household, plus at least three others that we know of, at least three other travelers. Emmy, what's up? I wish to simply inform you that it's said that she is a uh, You, you do read my notes or what, bro? Yeah, that's the, next, that's the next evidence, right? It says that she was a dealer in purple fabric, which was expensive if you didn't hear him, if you're listening online. Amy said that she was a dealer in purple fabrics, which is for royalty, and for whatever reason, it was expensive. And so she was like a, a fashionista, right? With like, like think of modern day woman, you know, international businesswoman who has a house in L.A. and a house in New York, right? This is the type of woman that Lydia was. She was intellectual. God, God used Paul's words, not his healing power, not all of these other things. He used his words to convince her of the gospel. So she was like a smart, international, rich businesswoman. She was a worshiper of God. She wasn't a Jew, but she was a worshiper of God, meaning one God, not all of the little Greek gods of the air and the soil and the fire and all those things. She, was, she knew that there was one God, and she wasn't really sure how to interact with Him. There was no Jewish synagogue there. She was ready. She was, she was informed, and she responded. And this woman says, what do I got to do to be saved, right? And she she gets baptized, her and her whole household, and it's life-changing for her. And as you think about Lydia, she is the absolute, complete opposite of the next person that we're going to encounter, who is a little slave girl. And then the next person that we're going to encounter, middle-class soldier jailer. So the church at Philippi is started with a rich international businesswoman. Then the next people are a little slave girl. And then the next family is like a middle-class, blue-collar type guy. This was a church that was multi-ethnic, multi-generational. 
socioeconomically diverse. This is our picture church to model ourselves after. This church in Philippi is a great model for us to follow and to look after, which is why I would love for us to look at this series in Philippians. It's pretty cool. So now just some closing thoughts, because I know we're getting close to time. Um, just some closing thoughts. As I, as I looked at this, I, I learned something new, uh, and I noticed it as I was reading, and I want to see if you notice it as you read this text as well, too. Look at the personal pronouns here in 6 through 10. Look at what it says here. It says, and they passed through, and after they came, they were trying and not permit them, and passing by Misa, they came to Troas, and then go down to verse 10. Look at how the pronoun changes. And it says, when, when he had seen the vision immediately, what? We. And concluding that he, God had called who? Us. So, in this text here, it goes from what? Third person to what? First person. Well, who's the writer of Acts? Who's, we talked about this already. Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke, at this point, this is where we know that, that Luke joined Paul in Troas. Okay? We see that, and I'm reading through this, and I'm like, wait, 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 I think I, think I found where, Paul jo- or where Luke joins him. So then I Google it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I was right. That's cool. God showed me something new. Pretty sweet. But we see here, if you remember, in the book of Luke, And so far in the book of Acts, this is Luke interviewing people, talking to Paul, getting his facts from other people about all of these things that had happened. And now it is personal eyewitness stuff happening. He's on board. He's part of the team. And that's why I said there was at least three people, Paul, Silas, and Luke, that get uh, invited into Lydia's home. And so from here on out, this is all eyewitness stuff from Luke. It was eyewitness stuff from others that had seen it, experienced all that, but now he's seen it with his own eyes. And you'll see things begin to kind of change a little bit in the way that he's writing. Kind of a cool transition. Uh, verse 10, change from they to we. Um, the next just closing thought that I think I, I want to draw out to us as, we, as we're in a, an important time for our church is that when, when God speaks, we need to respond. Okay? We need to obey. When God speaks to you, it is up to you to obey. And if you don't obey, if you don't do what he says, if you've been praying about something for years and you're not getting any answer, we really need for we really need to look at ourselves and say, is God just answering and I'm not I'm not willing to obey him? Have you continually disobeyed him for year after year after year, so much so that he's like, why even answer you anymore? You're not going to do what I say anyway. I can begin to think about that in my own life, thinking about it in our church life, things like that. Just something that I wanted for us to think about. Like I said before, your church council is praying through some, some issues, some decisions that we have to make, and I'm praying that we can be a church that will, when we look for answers and we hear those answers, that we will have the strength and the courage to obey those answers. So like I said, we're going to continue in this Philippian series. Um, Philippians is a pretty cool book. Uh, the next few weeks, what we're going to do is um, we're going to finish out chapter 16, and then we're going to take a pause, and we're going to look at Philippians. So your homework is to read Philippians. It's not like Acts. It's not, you know, 400 pages or anything like that. It's just a few pages. I want you to read Acts, and it might, I'm sorry, read Philippians, and it might be for your very first time that you've ever read the Bible. If you don't have a Bible at home, take one of those black ones home with you, okay? Read Philippians. It's in the back. Who has a page of Philippians? Someone find the page of Philippians on that black Bible for me so I can tell those of you that are taking that Bible home. Take that Bible home and read through the book of Philippians. There's just a few chapters, okay? What does it start on? 1627. Okay, page 1627. If you don't want to take that one home, there are Bibles online, there are apps, there are all kinds of things. I want for us to prepare ourselves for this series that's going to start in a few weeks by reading through the book of Philippians. There is so much in this book for us to apply to our lives, to change us, to mold us, to make us more and more like Jesus. I'm really excited um, about it. I'm excited for it.